Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening, everyone. My name's Gail. I'm an alcoholic. That is still a long walk for me from there. And I'm not doing any Daryl actions until they put this on video. So that's, <laughs> that's what I'm doing. Uh, welcome to anyone who's visiting tonight, and a special welcome to anyone who's new in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous tonight, especially Road to Recovery, if you're struggling or if you're returning. Um, because I, I had the privilege on, on Tuesday of celebrating my 10th happy sober birthday. And I walked in these rooms new and afraid and wondering, you know, what I was doing, how I could change, what would be here for me, was it the right place? And I can assure you that if you are an alcoholic of the type that's been described tonight by the three speakers, an alcoholic of the type that I am, and as is described in the basic text of Alcoholics Anonymous, recovery is guaranteed. There are promises in that book, and they come true. And that is why I can tell you with absolute authority that, you know, it's worked for me a day at a time. And the years don't matter. It's just the fact that it is a day at a time. I couldn't imagine being sober for any length of time. But it has worked, and it's guaranteed. And, and that, those promises are here for you. And, uh, you know, I'll get the Oscar bit over. I'd, I'd like to make thanks to people who really, really are important and, and have been in my life and brought me to this point. And my list is going to be slightly different from Neil's. And, uh, Nick, you don't, you're not in the first three either. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, firstly, um, and to me most importantly, I'd like to thank Mary, my sponsor. Um, because when I asked Mary to sponsor me, I effectively asked her to save my life. And I don't even know if I, I realized that or acknowledged that at the time, but I just knew I had seen someone who behaved differently from me, acted differently from me, and I wanted what she'd got without even knowing that phrase. And um, I had a couple of weeks of, of dry time, and I used the word advisedly. I was dry. I hadn't found any sort of sobriety. I was still as mad as a hen, and... Uh, you know, absolutely nuts. But I'd seen this woman, I'd heard her share, and I asked her if I could have a phone number, and she said no, and that was my very first resentment that I was aware of, because at the time, I was in a treatment facility, and she realized that there, there could well be a conflict of interest. But when I came back, you know, come to the meeting, and she would give me the phone number, we'd go from there. And... Um, I did find her, and I did ask her, and it was the single most important thing I'd ever done, because I have never, ever asked a human being to help me before. I am absolute self-will run riot. And Mary shares this herself, you know, I have not got an obedient bone in my body, just ask my husband. But as far as my sponsor is concerned, she would tell a very different story, because I have deferred absolutely to what my sponsor has asked me to do. I have become sponsorable for the first time in my life, and I continue to do those things today that I was asked to do on day one, simply because I see her doing it, I see the old-timers doing it, and it's worked. I have changed a day at a time by doing something differently, and that was following the guidance and advice of someone who's gone through the 12-step program as it's laid out in the basic text. And, you know, I, I continue to be in awe of her, and although we have a very close and loving relationship now, I am never her equal. There are times when we have great fun, great love, etc. But there's always that bit of a gap where if she needs to save my life by telling me what I am doing that will harm me or harm others, she will tell me. And believe me, she's the only person I will listen to. And I didn't come in agreeing that that's what I'd sign up to. It's just a fact that she is one person who can tell me. And it's the first adult relationship I'd ever had. I had parents in my life, I had family who genuinely loved me, and they couldn't reach me because alcohol reached me first. I have that degree of thinking which will always put a twist on it, which will always tell me that you're wrong. You're wrong, and I'm right, but not with my sponsor. And provided I keep that, and what I've learnt here in Alcoholics Anonymous in these rooms at the, at the front of my life, then I can continue this life. And I'm dressed like this tonight 
for the newcomer and for the people who will never, ever make it, those who have gone insane, those who've died, and out of respect for my home group because I see others come in and they dress up. I never used to do that. I didn't care what you thought. I didn't care what you looked like. You know, I, I fit in or I didn't fit in. It really didn't matter. But it matters today. The way I've learned to behave today matters, and so I dress up. And, uh, you know, I'm very proud to be part of this home group. And I'd like to thank my husband, Neil, because Neil, um, we came sort of back to Plymouth together, really. And um, tr uh, you have to trust me on this, that two people without sponsors are, are not, a good, not a good place to be in. And um, Neil actually came to a meeting. He, he heard someone share. And uh, he talked to the person at the end of that night. And uh, they said, well, you know, I, I go to the road to recovery. Come along. And Neil did. And up to that point, um, although I loved him very much, I, I love him far more now. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, nobody can predict where it's going to go. I hadn't changed. I don't know about Neil, but I hadn't changed. And I couldn't do relationships, and I couldn't do people, and I couldn't do anything very well. And Neil came to uh, this meeting, and he came home that night, and he had a grey card in his hand, and he got out a piece of paper, and he got out his big book, which I'd never seen before, and he got on his knees, and he prayed. And I was impressed, because that guy, the next morning, was different. He was a different person. And I'm very competitive. It doesn't work well in his triathlons and weight weightlifting, but I am very competitive. <laughs> and... Um, and, and I, I saw him reading this card, and I said, what's that? And he said, what's what? I said, that. <laughs> and he said, it's a little grey card. I said, what's on it? And he said, writing. Because <laughs> he was still difficult at that stage. And then um, I said, what are you writing? He said, joined up. So I said, what are you reading? And he said, the big book. He said, you've got one. And whether he was trying to hook me or not, I don't know, but it did. And uh, he kept the card in the bedside table. So, of course, when he went out. And I looked at it, and there were all these words, just for today, and a series of just for today actions, which I didn't know at the time were actions. And he came back in, and I said, I want one. And he said, well, if you come to the meeting, you get one. I said, can you get me one? He said, no, get your own. <laughs> so that Sunday, I um, took him to this meeting, and I saw him swallowed up in a group of people. And I thought, I'm not going there. And because I hadn't changed, I hadn't got any sort of program. I was still insane from, from the effects of the alcohol over 30 years. And... Um, he came home and he was changed again. He was happier and people were phoning him. And on Tuesday night, I was in. And that's where I saw Mary. And that's why I believe, you know, for me, that this, this program is, is, is powered and driven by my, my higher powers, I understand. And although it is a spiritual program, not a religious program, that is God. God brought me here because I was looking for Mary and I found her. And uh, the other person I would like to thank is Wayne for having the courage and the vision to start this home group with the, with the other old-timers who who become involved in it, in starting it, because it was here when I needed it. And I was wandering around Plymouth thinking, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I don't know what I've got to do to stay sober, but I knew I had to stay sober. My home was in chaos. My children, my eldest daughter particularly, hated me. She told me she hated me, and I knew it was true. I destroyed the lives of people I genuinely, genuinely loved, and I'd continued to do that for 30 years without, without ceasing. I just could not stop myself, and I had no idea that this was a living problem. To me, it, it was about booze. And I came in here, and the, the group that had been set up was set up by the traditions, by the steps, by the concept, by the book. And it was about structure, and it was about discipline, and it was about everything that wasn't in my life. And when I came in and I got a sponsor and I was asked if I was prepared to go to any lengths and I said yes, I was given responsibility. Responsibility for doing suggestions. Responsibility for turning up to my home group. Responsibility for service. Responsibility for the first time in life for me. And actually responsibility for phoning my, 
my sponsor every night because she said that relationship would be what I made it, what I put into it, and I never put anything into any relationship ever. But it's the first time I did. And uh, having done those things, things have changed for me. And then I went home and I did the things that I've just outlined. I got on my knees and I thanked my higher power, whatever that was. For me, it is God for having had a sober day because it was the first happy sober day I'd had ever. I mean, the, the thought of sobriety, the thought of not drinking absolutely terrified me because I had drunk all that time. I picked up alcohol as a teenager and I was off with it, off and running. A light went on in my head and I didn't know until I came into to AA that I have the sort of character where I don't know if I'm thinking about drinking first or drinking then thinking, it really doesn't matter. But at some point in any given day, I was going to pick up alcohol. And in the end, I was worse without it. I'd come to that jumping off point where I couldn't live with it and I couldn't live without it. It was absolutely terrible. I would go to bed at night and pray for the end. I would pray that I wouldn't wake up, I wouldn't wake up in the morning. And I didn't want to be like that because I adored my daughters. And I had no way of knowing that for me, I have a craving. I have a craving which, which is allergy based. When I pick up alcohol and have one, I set up something that I just cannot control. And that's as true today as it was 10 years ago. I, I will never have this licked. I will never have this beaten. I lost the power of choice. What Alcoholics Anonymous has given me is choices back. I can now make choices because I'm not drinking. And it would mean that if it was just a booze problem, as Kansi says, you know, when I put the booze down, I'd feel better. And, and for some reason, for me, I never did. Right from the word go. Right from the word go. I had consequences immediately, as those of you who know me will know. You know, with my father, I was, I was sick over him, and I was telling him that I hadn't taken the gin from the cupboard. And goodness knows there wasn't a lot of booze there. You know, but I lived my life on the, on the fringe of people was apparently being in the middle of people. I never succeeded in anything. Once I, I took up alcohol, I was fairly good at athletics and like Amanda, you know, I, I had a natural aptitude in my case, um, for sports, athletics, but as soon as I had to work at it, I didn't bother. You know, and anything that you ask me to work out too much bother now, I won't, I won't do that. Forget it. Um, and booze, booze, I thought, lit up my life. I thought it made me the person I am, and, and it did, and it was horrible because it's, it's exactly as it says in the Just for Today, as I give to the world, so the world will give to me. And I was never, never great, ever grateful, so it made sense to me when I was asked to write a gratitude list which came in with the suggestions that I wrote a gratitude list, things I'm grateful for, and on that is always that I'm grateful to be alive because I do not deserve to be here. I work every day to earn the right to be here by carrying on with the suggestions, but I, I didn't get here by my own volition. I should have been dead. And I was asked to pray again in the morning, to pray for a sober day to whatever I believed in, to read the Just for Today card, to study it, to do something from it, to put in action, because this is an action program. And as I said, I was never active. And to read the basic text, you know, at first I couldn't make much sense of it because my head was really, really gone. And so it was just, you know, a few lines, reread it, a few lines more, and gradually it became, you know, a few pages, chapter, which I still do today, to get a home group. And if you're new tonight, this is a wonderful home group. And I am biased, it is the best one in the world. And it has a very, very strong fellowship. But more importantly, it has safety for the newcomer. You can rely absolutely on what you're told here. And I need to know that because when I came in, I didn't know anything. And, and I was in trouble. And here, you know, there are any number of people who, who can sponsor you. And when you get a sponsor, become sponsorable, I would suggest. And if you don't know who's safe, if you don't know who's an old-timer, Ask Alison, the secretary. Otherwise, ask someone you hear tonight from the floor. And I was asked to get to my home group early, help set up, become part of it. Because if I was on the fringes, I would always stay on the fringes, and that's how I lived my life. I lived my life on the, on the fringes of my family, and I lived my life in the beginning on the fringes of other meetings. Here, I was thrown in because, as I said, with responsibility and choices came action, and I was expected to do service well. And it became a pride thing then. A, I wanted to do it better than Neil. And also, I didn't want to let my sponsor down. And also, I didn't want to let my home group down because I became accountable 
just as I have in the workplace now. And as, as a result of doing these things, you know, it says in the basic text, rarely have we seen a person fail who's thoroughly followed our path. I've thrown myself in as I've seen the old timers do, as I've seen the people whose recovery I want, you know, I want to emulate. I've done those things simply because they have worked for me. And I wanted it to work. I wanted to be different. I wanted to be able to make amends to my mother. You know, and Dan mentioned step four and five. You know, when I did step four and the three columns in the last column, never mind the resentments and what had happened and, and why I hated all these people, it was my accountability, my defects of character, my self-will, my self-pity, my arrogance, my pride, which is why on Tuesday when I had the gift of, of 10 years sobriety, God made sure it was April 1st, April Fool's Day. <laughs> And every year, you know, when I am lucky enough to reach that April the 1st, I wryly just laugh and think it's April Fool's Day. And I know that I've kept right-sized because I need to be right-sized. Because if I stop doing this, if I stop being at the center of my home group, helping in any way I can, then I will lose this. And I can't, I can't bear the thought of losing this because I have never had a group of people before whom I trust so much. I have never had a place where I want to be so much. And when I heard people, you know, like my sponsor and Wayne in the beginning saying, I wouldn't be anywhere else on a Friday night, and I thought, God, you need a light. <laughs> and I've realized this is my life. This is life because through this, I have got everything. You know, my sponsor has helped me to grow. I've learned painful lessons in recovery simply because I cause myself pain. I have this arrogance. I have this pride. I have this self-will. But I always try to learn, and I have never, ever disagreed or argued with my sponsor. She's the one person I will not argue with simply because if I start arguing and thinking I know better, I will lose this. And there have been times when I have just gone quiet because every bit of me is screaming to say something back. But at the end of it, she knows better. I asked her to save my life. And if I continue to do this, I can continue to have this wonderful life. You know, I am. I'm, I'm happily married to Neil. I love him so much, and I love him more than I could ever imagine possible. And I know Wayne says you have to be careful what you say because this is on tape, and it'll be... Really weird if it all goes wrong after, but um, <laughs> but I have no reason to believe that it will simply because I'm sponsored. I'm I'm only married because I'm sponsored, and I can't promise anyone who's not married here that you will get married. But for me, because I've learned to behave differently, because I've learned to follow direction, because I've learned about obedience to spiritual principles, as a re as the result of the 12 step program, the spiritual awakening. I have changed, and I can look at my part in things, and that's as true for work. And when an old-timer says something to me, or asks me something, or a newcomer needs help, that is how I live my life. And it is pivotal, because if I get out of bed and do not get onto my knees, first thing, then I'm saying I know better, and I don't know better than anybody. I know better than anybody that if I stop doing these things, the reality is that my thinking will change back. I can only do this. I only have a daily reprieve as long as I do these things. And I know I, I am so lucky today. My mother came down to live with us. I, I was able to make amends to her. Someone who I treated so shabbily, you know, like other people, if they upset me or annoyed me, they were just out of my life. And she was out of mine for two years and I had the opportunity to make amends to her. My eldest daughter, who hated me, um, she has a, a beautiful daughter and a beautiful son, and she trusts me with them today. And I am, I am so privileged to, to be able to be part of their lives. Um, the younger daughter, my younger daughter, Claire, you know, I made amends to her so well, she moved in with us, and we need to sort that out. Um, <laughs> I'm not quite sure. I haven't talked to my sponsor about how we get around that one and unamends. But uh, so all, all these simple things that I've been taught to do, things that are totally against my nature, going back to the fact that I do not have an obedient bone in my body, except where this is concerned, I've been able to take that out into the workplace. 
And I, w- I would like to stress that I'm saying this with all humility because this is God given to me as it has been to everyone here who's, who's done this program, the 12 steps and as in recovery because I know that of myself I am nothing. I absolutely know that today and I work very hard to be humble because as a, again, that's not my nature either. But I've, I've seen people I genuinely admire, you know, who haven't gone down as far as me in the drinking stakes, but are way ahead of me in the spiritual stakes. You know, John F.C., I mean, he didn't drink for as long as me, and I think he describes himself as a panty waste or something like that. I think it's panty waste. And, um, waste panties, yeah. And, um, and, and so I know the people's experience here, you know, they haven't had to come from the same place as me, so it means that if you are, you are struggling. You don't have to have drunk for 30 years like me. You don't have to get to that awful spiritual black hole where there is nothing in life, where you just can't see where the next day is going to come to, but the light goes on in your head and it says drink. And you know, despite yourself, you're going to pick up that drink as I did and you're going to destroy not only that day, but the people around you who genuinely love you because that was my experience and I hated myself. And today, I don't hate myself. You know, I, I understand happy sobriety. I know how I got here. And a counsellor once said to me, what do you want, Gail? And I said, I want to be happy. And they said, well, what's happiness? And I couldn't answer. Today, happiness is about taking little actions, about things that are infinitely easier. This is the easier, simpler option than, than drinking for me. That was hard work. And I had no idea how hard it was and how I wrestled with it until I came in here and found another way to live. And I have enormous gratitude, an outpouring of gratitude for, for the life I've been given. And, you know, if, if there is anyone new, if there is anyone struggling, this is a promise that you can have this tonight. By working through these steps, like Nick, when I came in, I knew I knew at depth I was defeated. I knew I was beaten, and I knew I needed to do something else. God, to me at that time, was a punishing God because I I bargained with him. I railed at him when he didn't give me what I wanted, but I recognized when my sponsor said that that was the rest of the world too. Nobody in this world could fulfill my needs, and that's another reason why, you know, I've stayed married, really, because I, I accept that Neil can't actually fulfill all my needs as I feel he should, you know, so sponsorship's good. But the thing is that it applies to all... The, oh, just a minute. It applies to all areas of my life where I think I know best, where I think I know best, I take guidance. I take guidance. And so I know for you... This can be the same. You can have the same, same results. And, you know, when, when I have the privilege of standing in front of my peers here and people I genuinely admire, people I genuinely aspire to be, to be like, I, I, I do, I, I feel myself, thank you, Alison, I feel myself the luckiest person in the world because I can do this week after week after week. You know, I can, I can get happy. I can change, I have choices in whether I ruin a day or I have a good day, and I see people around me who, outside of Alcoholics Anonymous, who can never change. They're unhappy, they're like me, but they're not alcoholics, so they can never give up alcohol, they can never know about the 12-step program because it won't mean anything to them. It didn't mean anything to my mum. She didn't understand why half a glass of sherry wasn't enough for me, and I couldn't explain it to her. I don't think I can still do that to this day. But if, if you are like me, if you are like the people in this room, your, your recovery is guaranteed. Those promises are absolutely written in crystal in the basic text of Alcoholics Anonymous, and they're there for you tonight, and thank you for listening. My name's Michael, I'm an alcoholic. Uh, let's start off by thanking Wayne for uh, sponsoring me all this time. Uh, I'd like to thank me mum. Uh, I'd like to thank my wife and my kids. I'd like to thank, thank Lord Jesus Christ. Um, I'd like to thank, thank uh, my father. Uh, who else can I thank? No one really. 
Anyway, yeah, my name's Michael, I'm an alcoholic, and um, I'm up here today, uh, 15 years sober, and um, if somebody would have told me that 15 years ago, you know what I mean, I would have uh, just laughed, you know what I mean, I feel uh, really blessed to be given a, a second second crack at, at life, you know what I mean, <laughs> to have experienced two different lives in one in, in one lifetime, basically, you know what I mean? Um, I arrived here at the end of November 1997, and um, I'd just been kicked out of a, a treatment centre, um, and I thought that was the last place that, that you know what I mean, was, go was going to help me. Um, before then, do you know what I mean, there was failed attempts from doctors, Doctors, counsellors, psychiatrists, everything that I thought I could try to stop my drinking or even control my drinking, I tried. And uh, nothing worked. It just got worse and worse and worse. And um, my drink, I, you know what I mean? I, I was one of these alcoholics that I'd never had a job, you know what I mean? From leaving school, I never had, really had like a job. I never had no purpose, direction. My life was about just. And, and my mates that I used to hang around with was was about just every day finding ways and means to just getting out of our faces. You know what I mean, and, and that was it. And um, I thought I thought working was for losers. Um, what would you want to work for? You know what I mean. I tried a few jobs and it's just so hard. You know what I mean. I just couldn't couldn't do it. And uh, I remember in in recovery, I, just, I, I was about two years in, into. I was about two years into recovery. I, I, I'd, I'd got a job. I'd started work. I'd gone through the 12-step program. And um, I was in a cafe uh, somewhere with my workmates. And, and uh, this bloke's come up to me and gone, uh, Hello, Michael. How are you? You're looking well. I haven't seen you for a while. He said, uh, What are you up to? And I said, and I thought, Who are you? And uh, I, I didn't have a clue who this person was. I thought, like, program, you know what I mean, higher power, get assertive, ask him, just, you know what I mean, so I said, yeah, yeah, no, no, fuck, sorry, sorry, uh, your face is familiar, but um, where do I know you from again? He said, I lived next door to you for about 10 years, <laughs> I was like, what? and then it, it, it clicked, our thought E was up to no good, because I would never see this person, he from first thing in the morning, he'd be gone. I wouldn't see him all day. And then all of a sudden, I may hear the door bang at night. And that was it. I'd never see it. I thought, he's up to no good. Didn't occur to me I had a nine to five job. <laughs> you know what I mean? This didn't, didn't figure. And, um, that was it. I had no, I had no concept on how to live life. Um, I had no, no focus, no, no ambition, no direction. Um, I just didn't have a clue. You know what I mean? I, I, I found out later that this was really my problem. It was not so much the drink, it was a living problem. And uh, when I look back, I was full flight from reality. You know what I mean? Um, I didn't want the normal things that normal people done. I, 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 I wasn't interested in, in these things. Um, relationships, you know what I mean? As long as they were... The girl was a good shoplifter. Uh, that was all right. You know what I mean? It's just, you know, uh, jobs. Didn't want a job. Didn't want a job. You know what I mean? She's a good shoplifter. Well, so that's fine. Um, break out every day, breaking the law. Um, up to no good. Um, to get money to drink. Um, that was my life, you know what I mean? Day after day, week after week, month after month. And uh, it got to a point where I thought I was having fun and everybody else was deprived of it. But there come a point where I thought I'd had enough and I tried to stop and I found out that I couldn't. And um, that's when like things got a bit scary, you know what I mean? And I'll try again, try and stop again. I'd last a couple of days, weeks. Maybe, you know what I mean? And it would backfire and uh, I'd pick up a drink again. I'd be in and out of prison. I'd go in prison and uh, I'd write letters home to the family, uh, promising not to do these things again. I'm going to change my life or I'll get a job. And, and uh, 
promises that are sincerely meant. And sometimes it'd be smudge marks in, in the ink. You know what I mean? Where, where I'm like crying, writing letters to me man or me mum. You know what I mean? Th- thinking, why do I keep doing this? You know what I mean? Why? Because inside I knew I was a good, a good person. You know what I mean? In, inside I knew I was a decent chap. And yet I kept, I was like Frank Spencer. You know what I mean? Everything I'd done just backfired and went wrong. You know what I mean? And, uh, it was so frustrating because I wanted to show everybody how good a decent chap I was. And yet, the order that I tried, it made me look a bad chap. You know what I mean? It's, it, it, it's just everything I've done, the, the opposite effect happened. And, um, I'd write these letters on me and I'd pry, I, I sincerely meant them from the bottom of my heart, yeah. And then I would, I would get, get discharged from prison, walk through the gates and I would totally forget what I've been in there for. Can I have one of them sweets, mate? Oh, well. Is that cough sweet? No? <laughs> but, but, um, yeah, so, uh, um, yeah, I'd get out of prison. I'd totally forget what, what I was in there for. And, um, I'd go out, meet the mates, pick up a drink, try and control it, make all right that night, make that, that may last a week and think, oh, it ain't too bad. But then, all of a sudden, any period of time, I would over, always overstep that mark and, and the inevitable would, would happen again. And, um, I would, I would be seeking out from the doctors, the counselors, the psychiatrists. Nothing, nothing worked. You know what I mean? In fact, the drinking got worse and worse and worse. Uh, the harder I tried, the worse it got. You know what I mean? And, uh, I didn't have a clue about alcoholism. Nobody ever explained, like, this illness to me. Like, you people did at me first meeting. The doctors, it was all about cutting down counsellors. It was all about cutting down and trying to get a control on it. Nobody ever told me about, like, the phenomenon of craving, the first drink that done the damage. That whenever I took a drink into my system, it would trigger off like a craving where I'd have to have another and another and another. And then when I heard that in, in an AA meeting, I thought, yeah, there, there wasn't very many times where I would have a drink and be content with that. Um, there was always that, that obsession, you know what I mean? Where if I thought about having a drink, then I was as good as drunk, you know what I mean? I, I would go to the end end of the world and back to, to get a drink. Nothing would stop me. Um, and when people described it, uh, the main the main symptom, the main problem of the alcoholic centers in the mind. You know what I mean? The, the, al- the drink is just a symptom. It's just a small part of the, the main problem centers in our mind. And um, I always thought the problem was the drink. And yet when people described to me that... It's like the jaywalker in the big book, you know what I mean? Or, or it's like a little child who, who touches a hot stove. They're not going to touch it again because they get burned and it, and it hurts them. Yet with the alcoholic, we don't seem to have any mental defense against the picking up of that next drink. That insane thought or notion that someday, somehow, I'll be able to drink like a gentleman. This is what I had. And I was told here that needed to be smashed. Many pursue it into the gates of insanity and death. You know what I mean? And, and I, I could see that. I mean, year after year after year. You know what I mean? I tried to control and it just got worse and worse and worse. And um, I arrived here, let's say, November 97. And um, I, I, I remember the reading. And one thing that stood up is probably no human power could have relieved us of our alcoholism. And, um, you know I mean, I'm not a religious man. Um, I was told that this is a spiritual where I could believe in whatever I wanted to believe, whether it's a de- dead relative, it's the power of this meeting, the power of AA as a whole. You know what I mean? As long as I'm praying to something that made sense to me, you know what I mean? However, however inadequate it may seem to other people, as long as it made sense to me, that was enough. So, uh, I remember, like, arriving here and, uh, listening to you people do what I'm doing tonight, and um, you people talk my language. For, you know what I mean? You people have been to the places where I've been, um, yet you'd found a way out. For the first time in my life, I didn't feel that I was a special case. You know what I mean? I, re- I realized that night that I was just like you people here. You know what I mean? I wasn't special or different. I was just like one of you. 
And again, for the first time in my life, around alcoholism and drinking and, and other things, I realized that well, if I do what you people have done, then why shouldn't I get the same results as what you people have got? And that's as simple as I kept it, you know what I mean? And um, really, it's a case of playing follow the leader, you know what I mean? I followed the people that went before me. You people won my confidence, you know what I mean? A blagger can't blag a blagger, you know what I mean? I know you people have been to where I've been. From the stories that you tell, like, I could match the mental inconsistencies around the insanity that goes before the taking of the first drink, this insane thought that will make it better. You know what I mean? No matter how bad your drinking got, you would always make it all right to pick up that next drink. I, I could relate to these things. So I, I knew you weren't lying. And um, I knew if you was like me, you wouldn't be stood up here saying that this this stuff really works. This is really good stuff and uh, really blows my mind. And you know what I mean? It's it just just unbelievable. It's amazing today. And if it was crap... You know what I mean? If it was crap, I would tell you it was crap. I would stand up here. Yeah, I'll be the first one to tell you, this is all shit. Don't listen to these people. You know what I mean? Because these people ain't got a clue. I've done this for so long now, and I ain't feeling no better. I would, I would tell you. You know what I mean? Especially after you're telling me to get involved with service and pick up stuff from outside and make cups of tea, and I didn't get no benefits from it. I'll be really, really angry. I'll be really angry. <laughs> Angry on the verge of being violent. <laughs> Ang angry on the verge of having violent tendencies. If, if I was tricked into doing work for somebody, not getting paid for it, and I didn't get nothing from it, I would be mighty, mighty, without swearing, peeved. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I started doing these things within weeks. You know what I mean? Within weeks... I was feeling something's working. I could feel a power working for me that I'd never felt before. I don't know what that power was or whatever it was, I could feel it working. I had weeks and weeks and weeks of no sleep, uh, withdrawing from uh, antidepressants, drink, and all these things. And um, I couldn't get to sleep. All I had was my list of suggestions, my sponsor's phone number, and the meeting was a lot smaller there, a few phone numbers of like other people in the meeting. Um, I used to meet up with Dave a lot. And um, I was doing these things, and uh, my two fears, it, it, it was the same as Dr. Bob. I had a fear of not getting to sleep, and I had a fear of running out of drink. <coughs> because if I ran out of drink, I wouldn't get getting any sleep. and I'd be tossing and turning, pacing up and down all night. You know what I mean? And yet, I didn't have none of these things in early recovery. And I wasn't sleeping. And I didn't have no drink. And yet, I was doing these suggestions. And um, I was feeling on top of the world. And I would phone my sponsor every day. I would tell him, I, I haven't had no sleep. But I'm feeling great. You know what I mean? I can feel that something is working. And I remember that first night when I got, uh, when I got a, a few hours sleep. And then I got a few more hours sleep. And then I got a few more hours sleep. And I was sleeping like a baby, right through, you know what I mean? And uh, I was just on top of the world, you know what I mean? I was, I was on top of the world. And um, this was early on in recovery. I, I, you know what I mean? Like, like John said, started, made, made a start on the steps. Within three months of working with my sponsor, I was doing my first step nines. And um, I went out making amends. And that was when my sponsor told me to get a job. And uh, you've all heard it before. I thought, why is he punishing me? You know what I mean? Why? And uh, but I did it. You know what I mean? I went out. I got a job. It was hard. Don't get me wrong. You know what I mean? It was hard. I was 26, 27 years old. You know what I mean? Never been able to integrate with society. And then I'm in this job, not having a clue what to do. Stood around half the time looking like a dummy. Um, afraid to ask anybody for help, and yeah, I persevered with it and went on to do do well at that. You know what I mean? And um, I've gone on from there. And then from 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 there, you know what I mean? The fifteen years that I've had in in AA does blow my mind. You know what I mean? And I would tell you if it was any different, and and it would be dishonest of me to to do that because 
my life today is unrecognizable to the one that I had before I arrived here. You know what I mean? People that I, I work for it and the business contacts that I have today, they haven't got a clue, a lot of them. You know what I mean? And like ones that I do get close to and, and I tell them, they, they, that's unbelievable. That is absolutely unbelievable. You know what I mean? They, they just, they can't picture such a fine fella like me <laughs> as le leading this, like, double life, like, 15 years ago. You know what I mean? I have prisons and institutions and, and them trusting me with all sorts of manner of things. You know what I mean? You know, it's such an upstanding pillar of society that I am. You know what I mean? It's, uh, I was never like that before. I was never, never like that before. I was locked up from society for being a nuisance. You know what I mean? And, um, it's little things like that. Um, this 12 step program as well in, in AA is always, for me, you know what I mean? Has always made me want to do the best I can in, in life. Um, in whatever I do, whether it's, um, Work, family life, um, just go for gold. I was always told go for gold, you know what I mean? Don't settle for silver, go for gold. You know what I mean? So from work, for, in, in my work, you know what I mean? I went back to college, done courses, you know what I mean? Set up a, set up my own business in, in what I do today, you know what I mean? And it, and in relationships as well, I was told don't sell, sell, sell yourself short. You know what I mean? Do the right things around it. Don't go sleeping about, putting it about. You know what I mean? Follow suggestions. Do the right thing. You know what I mean? When you meet somebody, take them, date them, get to know the person. You know what I mean? And I remember that opportunity arose. You know what I mean? With the beautiful, my beautiful wife that I, I, I'm married to today, Tammy. Best get mentioned, mentioned, uh, the wife and my kids, Millie and Maisie. You know what I mean? I remember when I first started dating Tammy, I would have rather have been put in a ring with Mike Tyson. The nerves that I felt, I was feeling sick, my legs were shaking. Don't tell her that. <laughs> <laughs> Give it a large, didn't I? But um, I was phoning up my sponsor. What do I do? What do I say? Where should I take her? You know what I mean? Well, just like so, never done it before. You know what I mean? Like, real. You know what I mean? This is a real deal in, in, in AA. You sober up and everything becomes, like, real. You know what I mean? And uh, I'd done the right things around it. Dude, took her out. And looking back on it, it's like the early days of recovery. Early My early days of recovery, and to anybody new tonight, they are not to be missed. You know what I mean? That feeling where it's all, like, new and you see a place where you're in society and that feeling that everything's going to be all right without a drink, without a drug or what without whatever it is, you know what I mean, that makes you feel better, you, you have this peace and this serenity that comes over you, and you know that if you keep doing what what we're supposed to do here, then it will just get better and better, you know what I mean, and, and that first feeling in early days was, was amazing, and it was like, like the same when I started dating my wife, you know what I mean, taking out, dating her, you know what I mean, going pictures, doing this, doing that, you know what I mean, it was, it was brilliant, and then a couple of years later, we got married. You know what I mean? And, uh, as a, as a sponsor and as a sponsee, you know what I mean? You, you hear it all the time. Oh, I'm never going to meet no one. I'm never going to do, you know what I mean? And, uh, but you may, you may not, but you put this first, the right things, whatever it'll be, will happen. And, um, you know what I mean? My life, my life is just, Amazing today, it is. You know what I mean? What AA has done for me, it still blows my mind today, and I know the most satisfactory years of our existence lie ahead. You know what I mean? Through, through the old timers that's gone before me, and also just, just knowing, like the 15 years that I've been around, just knowing that if you keep doing this, you know what I mean? You keep coming to your meetings, you know what I mean? Doing your suggestions, phoning your sponsor, you know what I mean? Doing service. You know what I mean? It gets better. Don't get me wrong, I've had my fair share of uh, ups and downs in the last couple of years. But so does everybody in life, you know what I mean? But I would say 99% of my time in AA is has been ups. You know what I mean? The small percentage of life on life's terms, trials and low spots is nothing, you know what I mean, compared to 
to the great things that AA has done for me, and I know we'll continue to do so as long as I put this first. And uh, you see so many people come in, you know what I mean, and they do well for months, years, you know what I mean? They get the wife, they, they get the job, their career, they get a new house or new car or whatever, and get a bit cut short and think, that's ideal, I don't, don't, uh, don't need to do this anymore, you know what I mean? I'll cut down on my meetings, seeing you know, I've got the missus. Was that stop and then I can share for another two minutes or was that, yeah, carry on for another two minutes, yeah? <laughs> Ideal. I seen the red one first, was I, I wasn't tripping, was I? <laughs> okay, Ideal. But, yeah. but um, yeah, so anyway, um, I'm having flashbacks now, all these uh, lights, lights going off. Getting paranoid now that another one's going to come on in a minute. But, uh, no, like I say, like AA and what this has done for me, you know what I mean? And uh, what I've seen from people that stop doing this, you know what I mean? Everything I have in my life today, I said this before, everything I have in my life today is on oil purchase from the, from this fellowship. And uh, if I stop my weekly, my monthly repayments to this fellowship, you know I mean, I know that the debt collector which is alcohol, alcoholism, addiction, or whatever it may be, you know what I mean, will come and take everything from me. I've seen that, you know what I mean? I've seen it happen year after year after year. And it's heartbreaking to see as well, you know what I mean? Because this illness affects families and other people like no other illness can. It rips through families, society, like wildfire, you know what I mean? And tortures the individuals, as it's happening, you know what I mean? And uh, to see people come in and get all these wonderful things in their life and be happy, and then the next thing you know, it's all taken away, and these people are, you know what I mean, just devastated. It is heartbreaking. But the thing is, it's here. Just got to keep doing what we was doing the first day that we, we were presented with when, when we arrived here. You know what I mean? And my little girl tonight, I've come down with my stuff on, and she's gone. To me, mum, yeah, dad's doing the main share of the night, isn't he? He loves that. He loves that, he does. Now, I heard her, you know what I mean? Where before they cry because I'll come into a meeting, now they know what I'm doing, you know what I mean? They, they know what the dad's got to do to, to keep the dad what they got. And uh, thanks for listening. So. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.